it's time for another science lesson with Tesla and T-Rex. TNT! Today we're going to learn about magnetism! Yay! And we're going to sing a song about electricity! Yay! Isn't that exciting, kids? No, it's not! All right, everybody, welcome to lecture 27 of ECE 2002. My name is Art Turlip. As per usual, let us begin. So, basics of frequency response. Um, this chapter is, I think, honestly, the most difficult chapter in the entire book. Um, number one, it's, it's very dense. It, there's a lot of stuff in this chapter. And number two, it's kind of a like many of the chapters before, it's one of these culminating points for everything that we've learned so far, um, including the knowledge that you are bringing in from phasers. So um, if you feel lost after watching this video, that's okay. Um, go watch some stuff on Bodhi plots. I'll see if I can come up with some extra materials, but if someone has any good reference material, um, please post it on Piazza, okay? Um, this really for signals and systems is going to be the heart and soul of how you start to think about the frequency space. So phasers are a nice tool, um, but they don't paint a picture. And today we're finally going to start to look at the entire canvas uh, for, for making our picture. In fact, my Bob Ross intro probably would have been better here for this lecture if I had thought about it ahead of time. Um, but that's that's effectively what we're doing is before we learned, you know, last lecture, we learned how to draw a line. Uh, we learned how to do a single frequency and we focused on this special frequency omega naught. Now what we want to do is examine an entire range of possible frequencies and examine the behavior of our uh, transfer function in in our, by the way, our transfer function exists in the uh, frequency space. So we want to look at how it behaves in the frequency space with a variety of different um, inputs that are sinusoidal, a range of, of nice real world frequencies. So recall that when we deal with real world frequencies, the J omega represents those really well for us um, in the, in the uh, frequency domain. So that's what we're that's what we're up against here. So when we're looking at plotting um, our range here, really where we're looking and what we care about is this range of of possibilities for s. Okay, and in in practice you'll look at all of this. So remember last time we actually picked a specific, a specific J omega naught, which lived right here, right? Wherever at some specific spot, right on that Y axis. Um, now we're looking at the whole range of this axis. And then in, in future stuff that you may do, maybe um, you may look at the entire spectrum of everything here. Okay. But for right now, all we're really concerned with um, is just just frequencies that are nice okay that makes sense to us okay so before we had um, phasers we had some kind of magnitude here uh, that we were measuring and I'm, I'm gonna tell you um, it's a little hard to keep track of this K with the the fractions but um, I edited the MATLAB code and I think it's a lot easier to to use actually than what it was even before. And it was pretty easy to use before. I mean, it was pretty dummy proof. Um, but I gave you guys some, some different possibilities so that you can explore a little bit more on your own. And I'll get to that later on as well. All right, without further delay, let us begin. All right, so as we increase the frequency, and this is the total magnitude of that frequency if you wanna think about it that way, um, we're moving further and further away from our origin, okay? and as I mentioned, we really only care about those purely sinusoidal uh, frequencies. So just, just the imaginary part of our S domain. Okay. So remember that the T domain 
exist on just a singular line, and then we transform things into being represented in this 2D plane. All right, so let's look at the entire frequency response of a very simple circuit. This is just a RC circuit. And what we're going to do is first transform this into our impedance model, our, our frequency space model. We're going to look at the phasor form of it, and then we're going to plot the phasor form of it for various omegas, okay, once we get it. Okay, so let us begin by looking at how we transform this guy. We're going to define um, H of S here as H I of S in this case. Because um, we have this input uh, nice in incoming current, so I think that's probably the easiest uh, transfer function to consider here. Um, so what we have is big I of S, big I N of S, and this just turns into a simple impedance. And because we have no initial conditions, this also just turns into a simple impedance as well. And noting here that um, while these are both impedances, this is simply... Um, just going to stay a quarter, right? But this actually becomes a function of S, right? This is a function of S where uh, this is 1 over SC. So note here, in case you haven't picked up on it already, resistors are constant even in the frequency domain, okay? Capacitors have time-based characteristics that transfer over to frequency-based characteristics in the frequency domain. As a matter of fact, it's much easier to examine their overall characteristics in the frequency space than it is in the time space, which is the whole reason why we're having this lecture today. Um, it, it's really, really nice to see things from this perspective. Okay, so recall that the phasor form of the transfer function is when S is equal to J omega. So we run this calculation. We, do, we calculate H of S which is, by the way, just these two things in parallel with each other. Recall that if we're, we're looking at uh, this equation here, uh, H I of S is simply the resistance of the circuit in a classical time-based model, if you want to think about it that way. But it's just this, the, the two impedances there um, in parallel with one another. So we just write that, and, and this is what we end up with. So using our handy-dandy parallel operator, because we have... Uh, these reciprocal values, it's very easy to uh, put this together. What we end up with then is if we rewrite this in polar form, which we can do, uh, it's going to look like this. Um, not too bad to, to put this in polar form. A reminder is if you are having trouble, you can look at it this way. The top is just 1, right? It's that magnitude of 1 at 0. So it's 1 at 0 degrees. And then this one here, uh, we can draw it out as follows. We have plus 4. Let me do a different color here so you can see what's going on. Plus 4 this way. And then it's uh, plus 2 j omega. Um, that's fine. We'll just put uh, 2 omega this way. And this is 4. So then the total magnitude of this then is... Uh, 4 squared plus 2 omega squared. That simplifies to just this thing here, okay? And it's just 1 over that because that's how we deal with magnitudes, so no worries there. And then the angle here is just going to be the arctangent of omega, excuse me, uh, 2 omega over 4, which simplifies to omega over 2. And it's a negative sign here because we're in the denominator, right? So it's effectively 0 minus this arc, uh, the original arc tangent here of these two. So that's why it's a minus sign. Okay, clear as mud. All right, so now we have our really nice polar form here. And so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna plot two different things. We're gonna plot the magnitude and the phase. Okay, and these two components of any signal or anything are always the most important things to consider. Really, all stuff in electrical engineering that you do that has like any kind of signal or anything boils down to a magnitude and a phase. 
All right, so let's plot these two functions, okay, separately. Now, I'll have you know, I love you guys very much. So you're able to plot these because I've given you the script for it. Aren't I a nice guy? Yes. Yes, I am. You're welcome. What can I say? What can I say except you're welcome? Except you're welcome. <laughs> I love that song, by the way. When you have little kids, you get to watch some of these really stupid movies, and some are worse than others. Looking at you, Frozen. Your terrible movie. Go to the garbage. But some movies are really good. Like, Moana is, like, got one of the best soundtracks of any movie. And uh, Jermaine Clement does one where he is, like, the crab down at the bottom of the sea. And it's really got some fun syncopation to it. Um, I don't know. I'm starting to really like music these days. So I don't know what's going to happen to me over the next four years. But I've got an accordion now. And, and now I'm, like, analyzing music and film scores and Disney movies. Anywho, let's dig into this plot. So you guys should kind of be familiar with what, um, whoops, a, uh, one over the square root of four plus omega squared. How do we know what this would even look like? Um, well, the best way to approach a problem like this, when you don't know what the plot looks like, if you had to say plot it for s some reason, um, I don't think you'll have to in this class, but you'll run into situations where this does occur, um, in the job or, um, at school just plug in some values. So as I make this really, really small, what does this become? Well, it just becomes a quarter, right? It's just half over the square root of four. That's a quarter. That's what we see here. As I let this grow, does it converge to any kind of, does it have a limit, right? As, as omega goes to infinity. Um, yeah, it goes to zero, right? Because it's effectively if this gets really, really big, this is effectively just omega uh, down in the denominator, and so this just becomes um, zero down here. So we know that our function has to live, and it gradually converges to zero on this side. Uh, and on this side, it could have some kind of herky-jerky behavior, but we know that the square root function is smooth. We know that this exponential function is smooth. And we should have some relatively linear characteristics in there somewhere because of uh, 4 plus omega squared, square root. When this kind of starts to peter out, this is effectively becoming just 1 half over omega as omega overtakes the 4. Okay? So there's a lot going on here. But at the end of the day, you could actually plot this pretty easily by yourself without the assistance of a calculator or a, a graphical toolbox like... MATLAB, okay, with a with a script in there. So that's that's an easy one. Um, the arctangent function, uh, you should know what an arctangent function looks like. That and the logarithmic function are the two most useful functions in in almost all of signals processing. I think I've I used an um, a logarithmic function. I'm sorry, a uh, logistic function is what I meant to say. An arctangent function and a logistic function. Um, probably every two weeks when I was in the Air Force to, to try to model stuff. Um, they're just so nice at capturing behaviors, and they're easy to calculate. They're easy to calculate and think about. And sometimes they have relevance, and sometimes they you're just making up something that kind of fits the best you can um, if, you, if you're doing modeling or something like that. But uh, keep these in your back pocket and always know what they look like and how to, how to scale them and how to shift and move them around. For example, um, I've used an arctangent function in scaling it and stuff to try to create probability distributions for how far off the angle is for, uh, say, a, a missile telemetry or something like that. Which direction is the missile actually facing? Well, you can use something like this to grab up uh, probabilities of where which direction it's kind of facing. So, yeah, these things have applications, and... Uh, you know, know what they look like so that you can use them readily. Anyways, that's my rant. Okay, so we know what the arctangent function looks like. Um, this guy's just going to range between here and here. Um, and there's no scaling factor here, so this is just going to live between uh, minus pi and pi, depending on how we do stuff with that. Um, and in fact, it just lives between minus pi and zero for this particular one. Uh, no worries here. Okay, so with that in mind, um, 
that's neat and all. What's actually going on when I examine this graphic? Well, there's something else here that I haven't really talked about, right? So what does this mean in terms of our circuit? Well, when I'm at a very, very low frequency, recall that 10 to the minus a large number is just something very, very small, still greater than zero, but still very, very small. Okay, so this is getting smaller and smaller, but it never actually gets to zero, if that makes sense. So these, this is like zooming in on a microscope as you go this way, and this is zooming out, okay, with like a telescope this way. Okay, so if you've never seen a log scale before, look it up um, and get get a gauge on how log scales work. Okay, because that's something you should probably know by now. Um, okay, what else do I want to say about this? Oh, right. So um, as this gets close to zero in the frequency, this effectively just becomes a resistor or an impedance of just a quarter. We don't really care. It's, it's a fixed constant impedance for our transfer function. And that's because, you know, that's how a capacitor is going to behave uh, as an open circuit at low frequencies. So there's just that resistor in there effectively. It just open, it keeps it open um, at the capacitor part. However, at higher frequencies, we get... Um, damn near zero uh, output voltage. But we also have a negative 90 degree phase shift, okay? So this is totally consistent with what we perceive for capacitors. So note that in most of your education so far, for, for most of you guys, what you've seen is just kind of the end behaviors of these, right? You've seen like, okay, at DC it does this and at AC it does this. But that's only because you assumed that your frequencies were above a certain threshold or they were at a nice threshold. Now we can see that the transformation as I start to do a little bit of wibbly wobbly faster and faster, I start to actually conform from one uh, model or heuristic to another. Okay. I'm actually uh, changing the behavior uh, the perceived behavior of that uh, capacitor just based on what the input frequency is. Okay, does that make, I hope that makes sense. Um, so we're going to, we're going to see a lot of examples here uh, coming up through the next few chapters um, in doing additional things to these charts and, and these graphics and stuff like that uh, in these transfer functions. So you'll get a lot of exposure. Okay, here we go. Um, so let's summarize. So here, up high, we had uh, one quarter magnitude for low frequency. And so this basically um, open circuit capacitor just resistor. Okay. And then we do that like this. Oops. <laughs> and then this one here is uh, basically short, i.e., no VC. but we have a minus 90 degree phase shift. Okay, and note over here that these are in radians, all right? Uh, I think I changed it to degrees for the most recent version of the MATLAB script. So again, you're welcome. Uh, but <laughs> uh, you can play around with that if you like and, and change it or fix it if it's not that. Um, and then, of course, here is the same, but uh, let me pop it up here. No, no phase shift at low frequency. Okay. Does that make sense? So this stuff here is the high frequency. 
This stuff here is the low frequency. Okay, that should summarize pretty well. All right, now we're gonna look at the graphical approach real quick. And I think I'm gonna cut to the MATLAB after this for a little while and do some of the lecture on there because it allows me to show you guys some more of the uh, of the functionality of this. And then once we've kind of got a feel for some of these um, these frequency responses in, in what we call Bode plots, which are what these are, by the way, these are Bode plots. B-O-D-E plots. Um, and we'll come back and we'll, we'll actually work through the examples by hand a little bit. So the hand method only works when you have like at most three or four poles and zeros, okay? It, it becomes very cumbersome to try to calculate past that point uh, and plot out by hand. It's just a pain in the butt. So that's part of the reason why we have this, this calculator here and why in the professional world you'll have some kind of um, frequency behavior plot that'll uh, be useful for 90% of what you got to do. You may have to invent some stuff too along the way. So coding is always useful. Okay, let's do a little bit of this here. So we know that HS can be described as one polynomial over another. We factor this polynomial. Uh, oops. Sometimes. This one's an M up here. Uh, S minus P1. S minus PN. Doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Okay, so this is... And we're going to talk more about this in the next chapter, but when we do scaling, this is going to become uh, huge for us. But for right now, you can think about this as the scale factor. Um, that's going to kind of get changed in the next lecture. I apologize. But for right now, we're just going to treat it like a scale factor. And that's fine. Uh, okay, as we keep our examples kind of simple and consistent, it's sufficient. All right, so reading from the book a little bit here, recognizing that we concern uh, purely with sinusoidal frequencies, i.e. omega, not complex frequencies, we need only evaluate this equation along the imaginary axis where uh, s equals j omega. So let s equal j omega. And what this is going to do for us, notice that when we had s, we were free. I'm free, I'm free, to go anywhere we wanted to. And so we could have S's that actually took us to these zeros and S's that took us to these poles. But if we restrict our behavior to just being on that imaginary axis, something interesting happens. We start to observe the frequency response of the system. All right, here we go. So the way we calculate this then as we're plugging in uh, j omega for all of these different s's, I'm not going to rewrite the expression. And then we're going to convert this into magnitude and phase. So we're going to take this from a rectangular system to a polar system. And what this becomes then is h, oops, h j omega is equal to k. And notice here this is the magnitude, not just like the absolute value. Because absolute values of a, of a complex number don't really make a whole heck of a lot of sense. But you can think about this as being, if you want a formal definition of it, this is j minus, uh, j omega minus z1 times j omega minus z2, z1 squared, square root. Okay? That's what this, this guy is here. If you're really looking to try to do the calculation. Um, but if you plot these in, if you plot this in the complex plane, what does this look like? It's just this vector here, right? Because this is a a plus b i kind of form. Um, so you end up with some magnitude and a phase angle, and that angle is we just write it like this: the angle of. Uh, usually, that underline sticks with the whole thing. Uh, sometimes typescripting is really hard, uh, even in LaTeX. If some of you have you know, started using LaTeX, good on you. If you haven't started using LaTeX yet, by the way, 
Um, actually, I realize some of you may not have. So, okay, and no, this is not just me being sarcastic, okay? Latex. No, this is actually just um, the way you, you write it. It's a word processor for mathematics. Now you say, oh, I'm an engineer, I don't care. Um, you really care about this because if you ever want to write something and make it look nice and not have to mess with Word Editor for like 30 hours, uh, you need this. And in fact, most forums and stuff like that will have um, some kind of editor where you can go into, you know, like for example, Piazza, and it's not exactly LaTeX form because in LaTeX you don't need the double, but um, in Piazza you can write something like this, right? And this is real math notation here. You can think about it as this is a subscript, and then everything captured by these parentheses uh, goes down into that subscript or these braces. So this actually becomes something like this, and it's a nice, fancy math font when you do it, okay? Automatically. Um, so there's just a myriad of things. It makes writing very complicated equations very, very simple. It's kind of hard to read in the codes, in the code, but once it renders out, it's just beautiful. Um, so if you haven't yet, it's totally free. Um, one program, the best one I recommend is Overleaf and it's free to use and it uses your, uh, Purdue account. So you can just go into Overleaf, make an account with your Purdue email, uh, use your institution, uh, for that. And, uh, you can start typing up really nice looking stuff. And let me tell you, um, I've gotten a lot of brownie points as a, both an undergrad and as a, um, uh, as a professional in the field, uh, LaTeXing documents and making math equations look really, really nice. So this is my plug for that, for you guys to go learn it. If you haven't already, go do it. Um, very important. But this is where you want to go is Overle I think it's overleaf.com. Let me check real quick. Yeah, overleaf.com. And then you can start making projects. You can share them. They have tons of examples. It's, it's really a great uh, site for using this software. There's other programs out there that use LaTeX. Um, they're all pretty good too, but this one's the best one I found so far. Okay, rant over. Let's keep rolling along. Um, so what you end up with here then is just the product of these polar representations of the function. Okay, I'm just going to put dots here and then j omega minus p1, same deal. Magnitude j omega minus p1 dot dot dot. All these guys multiply together. So effectively, the best way to write this, if you haven't seen this notation before, product t equals 1 to m of j omega minus ck. This just means multiply them all together. And you can see where this is going. Actually, since these are two different indices, it really doesn't freaking matter because they're internal to themselves. Okay, so since these are not the same k, okay? It's just a running index. Nice. Okay, so there we go. Uh, same thing with the angles, except they're going to be summed together. We talked about this last time. This is equal to this. J omega ZK. Oops. Minus ZK. Minus, and if I bracket this off, I can totally use the same index again. Notice here that these two values are in fact different, even though I have the same, uh, I'm reusing, recycling, uh, that same running index. Um, it depends on the number of poles and the number of zeros you have, which in fact could be distinct from one another. So we need to uh, make sure that those constants exist properly outside of uh, the context of the summation. Okay, but by and large, um, when you go, whenever you run a placeholder variable, you know, you can recycle it as long as you're clear, okay? Don't worry about having to make a new letter every time you, you make another portion of things. As long as you denote where you live on things, you're good to go. 
Okay, so this is our final form for both of these pieces. Um, why does this matter? Because it seems kind of obvious, right? We, we know how to deal with phasers and phaser notation. Why do we bother writing this out? Well, the reason we bother writing it out is because when we want to probe and test different values for our frequency, different omegas, the best way to do it is to plug everything in to these two equations based on all those poles and zeros. And so what we effectively can do is we, we transform we transform our transfer function into just this business and this business. And what do you know? We're able to easily plot out our, um, our magnitude plot, which is this, by the way, and our phase plot. And that gives us a lot of information about the system. Okay, so for these angles, one thing important to note here is that when I'm calculating the angle, let's say I have a point, let me not use an X, let's say I have a zero right here, and the point in question is here. So let's say this is 2J, and let's say the, the J omega that I'm testing is 1J, okay? Then my angle is pointing from my pole, or I'm sorry, from, from my zero here, back down to the point that I'm probing. Okay, so in this case, the part contributed by this particular zero would be equal to minus 90 degrees. Okay, so that's going to be important uh, moving forward. Uh, similarly, for here, these are calculated the same way, except I'm going to subtract them at the end. Okay, so now I'm actually going to switch to MATLAB, and I'm going to talk on there for a minute. Uh, and then I'm going to come back and we're going to do some of the calculations that we see uh, from that MATLAB script. All right. See you guys in a minute. So now what I'm going to have here is some MATLAB from the pull zero plotter. And actually, this is a Bode plotter, too. Um, so this is going to capture those Bode plots for us. I'm going to take example two from the book here. So this transfer function, and we're going to plot its poles and zeros, and then we're going to look at its frequency response. And remember that for the frequency response, what we're effectively doing is probing at different uh, values for omega where we're putting in j omega for our s. Okay, because those frequencies, those real frequencies are defined by j times omega. Uh, so here we go. I've picked out these zeros here, and I've picked out the poles from that equation. So you can see that here nicely, right? And I'm going to go ahead and just run the script. Actually, uh, yeah, I'm going to run the script. Okay, so before we even look at that one, let's let's not cheat. Um, what we're going to do is think about the behavior of this system as I move my omega around, okay? So let's think about the magnitude first. For the moment, I'm going to set these poles aside, and I'm not going to worry about them until I start to look at the end behavior. I only care about frequencies that are positive, effectively. Um, so I'm just going to go from zero to infinity here. For this uh, pull zero plotter, when you turn off the log scaling, you actually get the negative, but that's just to get some symmetry and stuff in there. Um, you don't need to worry about that right now. I'll, I may change it in the future, but you're welcome to change it yourself. Anywho, let's see what happens. So at zero, what do I expect for a magnitude? Well, it's going to be um, looking at the distances between these different poles and zeros, right? It's looking at all these distances and it's either putting them in the numerator in the case of the zeros, right? Or it's putting those distances multiplied together in the denominator in the case of the poles, okay? So I have these distances multiplied together, their magnitude multiplied together, divided by the magnitude of these guys multiplied together. As I move ever closer to this point, I am going to dip down, right? I'm going to dip down, and I'm going to hit 
a distance of zero at some point here, right? So that magnitude of that vector goes to zero, which means the entire expression for magnitude should also go to zero, right? So at omega equals two, I expect a dip down to zero for my magnitude. Great, so I start off somewhere and I gradually dip down and hit two. Once I hit two, I come back up and now I have a, a new, magnitude is always gonna be positive by the way, right? Because we're taking the magnitude of the vector, which is absolute. So as I move up, I, I start to become more positive, but let's think about the end behavior of this as I move out to infinity. So effectively, these guys are going to shrink down to the axis, right? With respect to moving all the way out to infinity, these are effectively on the axis as this goes really, really, really high. Um, so I have the you know an infinite distance times an infinite distance divided by an infinite distance times an infinite distance times an infinite distance. So I have three infinities in the denominator and I have two infinities in the numerator. So as this goes off to infinity, I expect to have infinity squared over infinity to the third, right? Which is gonna give me one over infinity if you wanna deal with it that way, which is effectively zero. So I know right off the bat, just based on the number of poles and zeros and where they sit, and based on where this guy sits, right on the axis, by the way, that my behavior for my pole zero plot should have a dip that hits zero right at two, and then it's going to, as it goes off to infinity, converge to zero. All right, so I'm gonna have the, I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of this here. We, we talked about, this doesn't mean crap, um, don't worry about that. Log scaling is on, so my x axis is going to be log scaled here. And we're, we're gonna show you what that means. I'm going to leave the decibel representation off for right now. And this k factor is a constant magnitude factor factor which we'll address as we go back to the example that we started with today in lecture. Okay so don't worry about decibels and don't worry about this this factor and we'll talk about this. Got it? Okay let's reveal what do we have. So for our plot it has exactly what we expected. As a matter of fact this was maximized uh, as we approach zero for our for our frequency. This is not unlike what we saw earlier in, in that one plot. So here at this point, at some, you know, omega greater than 10 to the zero, what the heck's going on there? Well, this is a log scale. Welcome to the log scale. So we have uh, 10 to the zero, that's one. So I'm counting by ones for the scaling. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Then I'm counting by tens. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100, right? 10 squared. Do, 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 do. Now you'll notice that you know the distance between one and two in our normal scaling is the same as the distance between two and three. Well, with log scaling, because we're telescoping and we're we're scaling so that this is like making it more and more like a microscope, and this is more and more like a telescope moving us ever ever further out. We get this telescoping effect on our on our scale and. Effectively, we use these extra lines in between to help us recognize where our conventional number system is in a log scale format. So, that being said, let's find two on here. So this is one, so we just count by ones from here, so this is one. If I wanted to count, say, uh, 21, I could go 10, then 20, and then take a, t you know, not quite a tenth of this, but a large chunk of this, to get 21. Does that make sense? Okay, I hope so. So you can do telescopes within telescopes here if you want to try to subdivide things. So you would you see how this goes from big distance to small distance? You could take this metric and squish it into this block or into this block and you'd be able to subdivide it up. So this would be 20 and then you jump another one into that squish version of, of that block and then you jump one to get 21, okay? Pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so we have a dip at two, and then it goes to zero as it goes off to infinity. This is fantastic, this is exactly what we expected. All right, let's talk about what happens with our, try not to, try not to cheat here. <laughs> what happens with our, our, 
our angles. What's our phase? Okay, well, so let's look at that equation again real quick because this one's a little bit more complicated. What we're looking at here is the angle between the zero and where we're at on the j omega axis. And we're summing all of those angles together for all of our zeros. And then we're looking at all of our poles and doing the same thing, but we're subtracting them off. Okay, we're subtracting off those angles. So let's, let's look at our example. So for this one, what we're doing is we're looking, let's start at zero here, exactly at zero. So looking from this pole down to zero, that's negative 90 degrees, right? But coming up from this way, that's positive 90 degrees because these are complementary to each other. So that's positive 90 degrees minus 90 degrees, summing those together. So those cancel each other out for the phase angle. Similarly, these two poles are gonna cancel each other out. Um, going from here to here, plus the angle from here to here, um, they'll cancel. So the only thing I'm really left with is this angle right here. What is this angle? Well, this is actually just uh, equal to zero, right? Going from here to here. So this is just minus a zero. <clears throat> so it's still just zero. So we expect that our phase should start at zero. Our phase shift should start at zero. And then what happens as I move up? Well, the textbook actually walks through a couple, uh, at least one point in here. I'm actually gonna look at the end behavior a little bit more first and uh, look at what happens at a specific uh, special point. So as I move up to infinity, and I'm looking back at all these poles and zeros here, right? I can kind of cluster them together on the axis. So as I look at what happens as I go to infinity, what I'm gonna have is the zeros are gonna point up, so 90 plus 90, because this is way up here, and these are effectively squished to the axis because it's so far away that these might as well be on the axis. So these are plus 90 plus 90 plus 90 as well. So it's 180 minus 270. Well, 180 minus 270 is a minus 90. So what we end up with here then is minus 90 as we go off to infinity on our phase plot. Now at, at this point here at two, we should expect a shift of 180 in our total sum. Why is that? Well, as I approach this, um, the angle that this is contributing is minus 90 and then it flips as I cross this threshold to being a positive 90 influence. So I expect that my my phase will shift by 180 degrees and it will shift in the positive direction, 180 degrees. All right, so let's look at our phase plot then down here. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. So we start off at zero as we predicted and then we, we fall, fall, fall and then we jump up 180 degrees. And then we fall down to minus 90 for our end behavior. Because as we go out to infinity, this is going to continue getting larger. I'm sorry, uh, uh, it's going to converge to minus 90. All right, so let's look back at the book here for our transfer function of our original system. So our transfer function for our original system looked like this. When we factor out that extra factor, we get a one half S plus two. So our pole is gonna be at minus two and we're gonna be looking at a magnitude of one half. So keep in mind here that although our pole is at minus two, what we're effectively inputting into the system is J omega. So it's for all these different J omegas, but for the purposes of our plotter, we can just put in nothing for the zero because there are no zeros a minus two pole, and our scale factor here is actually just one half. And I'm gonna leave the, the decibel scaling on so that you can see what happens. Or I'm sorry, leave it off so we can talk about it a little bit. This plot should look fairly familiar. This is the same one that we have in the book. Uh, we know where this comes from and what's going on, but let's look at it from a pole zero perspective again. And this time, instead of looking at the phasor mechanics of it, we're actually just gonna use our handy dandy equations. So for our equations here, um, what do we have? Well, we have just, for the magnitude, it's 
the product of all the, the these zero magnitude vectors, well, that's just one because there's nothing up there, and then uh, divided by the product of the distance between the pole and the uh, the point in question on the on the axis there. So as I this is like maximized here, right? This is as close as I can get. If I stay on this line, if I stay on this line, the closest I can get to this pole is right here. So that is when I will have the most uh, magnitude here because it's gonna be one over the shortest distance, the smallest possible distance. So I wanna minimize the distance since it's in the denominator, right? to get the most out of it. As I get further and further away, that denominator in this expression is going to grow, 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 and so I'll get a very small number, and in fact, it'll get close to zero for my magnitude, right? So as I move further up this axis, this gets really, really far away, and so I have like effectively one over infinity, right? So as it goes to zero. That's exactly what we see in the plot. Okay, so what's next, the angle? Uh, so for the angle, I start off here. Uh, this is just looking this direction, so it's a minus zero, so that's just zero. And then uh, as I move away from this, it's going to be pointing this way. So it's minus whatever this angle is. So at about one, I expect it to be, um, I don't know, what is this? Uh, two over, over one, so something kind of small. Um, and so yeah, right at one here, we're right at 30 degrees, two over one, or near 30 degrees. As I get, um, where would this be equal to 90, by the way? Let's do that, that's even easier. So right here, or not 90, uh, 45 degrees. So at 45 degrees, I would have these two sides equal to each other, so this would point at negative 45 at two. So at two here, you can see that this is about at, um, sorry, right, uh, right here this is about at 45 degrees negative 45 degrees because I'm subtracting it off okay and then it just continues to go off and off and off until this is eventually just pointing upwards at 90 so minus 90 because we're subtracting off the poles there's only one pole so it just converges to minus 90 a lot easier to, to contemplate yeah so in practice and I think in 301 you're gonna end up doing this um, you'll end up trying to calculate based off of a specific point in an, you know, an arbitrary location in the complex plane. It's actually much easier to do if you only consider those, those points along that axis. Um, so when you're doing that calculation later on and, and trying to plot that, it becomes a little bit more difficult to um, get out those magnitudes and frequencies easily. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about decibel scaling. So let's let's decibel scale this guy, um, and then you'll be able to see some some cool features here as well. So you can see here, right at two, on this decibel scaling, you can really see the knee of that curve is just right there. Okay, if I had to pick where the kneecap went, it'd be right there. Um, now, what is the decibel scale measuring over here? Yikes! What are these negative numbers? You can't have a negative magnitude. That doesn't make any freaking sense. Well, remember that decibel representation is actually just uh, a logarithmic scale in and of itself. So these are actually powers of some kind of function, right? And that function is defined for you uh, in the textbook, actually, pretty nicely. Uh, I think the, let's see, where does he have it? Yeah, it's right about here. So this is our decibel scale for, for our system here. So. You have your formula if you need to see that, but just know that decibels are basically just another version of a log scale, okay? So it's it's a nice way to write a log scale. Um, why do we use it? Well, notice how straight this line is. So after we've gone over that curve, this line effectively becomes just a straight line. So we can actually see that this falls down. Um, where can I see a nice version of this? So this is negative 25. Let's go with this one. So minus 25-ish over a decade gives me minus 20. So I have about a drop of 20 decibels 
over the length of or, or over the scale of uh, 10. So power of 10. So as my frequency goes up by a factor of 10, log scale here, so as I go up by a factor of 10, my decibels go down by about 20. This is much easier to represent than say some kind of curvy function because now I have a linear scale that I can, I can work with. And in fact, um, you may know as an electrical engineer that most of the stuff we do is in decibels. Um, so it's, it's a useful tool to have because it creates this linear behavior, not just because we like working in decibels, because we like working with lines and decibels make the lines for us. So that's why we have these kind of scalings on here so that we can approximate behaviors linearly. That's it, that's the whole reason. Okay, to keep this as a singular contained lecture, I'd like to just make this a long one so that you can see everything all in one go, okay? So let's do uh, one more example here. This is gonna be example five out of the textbook. And we're gonna see some really interesting behaviors from this function here. So we're gonna do our zeros at minus one and our poles at minus a tenth and minus 10. So there's a factor of 10 there. So let's see what we get there, minus one and minus 0 0.1 and minus 10 here. So we'll delete this, these two charts. So let's look at our pole zero plot to make sure we have it first. So this is a 10th, it's not quite at zero. This is 10, so we have some weird scaling going on. Okay, so there you go, I turned off your circle for you. Um, so what do I have here? Well, I have um, two knees in my curve. All right, we're gonna talk about what, the, what those are doing. So you notice that our, our first example from the lecture today had one knee in its curve, and that was where the poles were. This one has two. And that's because we have these two separate poles. Everything's off the axis. So for our, um, for our behavior here, we're actually gonna get some changes in the magnitude, some significant changes in magnitude right at uh, that 45 degree angle. And that should kind of intuitively make some sense to you um, because that's when things start to shift from um, growing at a particular kind of rate to growing at more of a linear, actually uh, linear with respect to decibels and, and log scaling kind of rate. So notice that as I move in this region, it's kind of just slowly growing. And then after I hit that 45 degree, it just kind of is near that curve and then it grows off really, really fast. Um, similarly here, if you were to zoom in, you could think about it that way too. Oh, what's that zero doing for us? Well, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the Bode plot, we'll see. We'll plot it without that zero in there in a second here, and you'll see what kind of behavior we get. But basically, we're starting off at something kind of small here. Um, notice that this is in decibels, and as a matter of fact, let me take it off of decibels just for a second so you can see uh, what this actually looks like a little bit easier. So we're starting off at 0.5 for this example. And we slump down and then we slump down again. Uh, our first slump is occurring right at, let me jump back to decibels here. So you can really see the knees better. Our first one's occurring right here at a tenth, right? For that knee, first knee. And our second knee is occurring right at uh, uh, 10. So from a Bode plot, you should be able to guess where the poles are right away right away you should be able to guess kind of where the poles are okay if they're if they're just real poles especially um so what's happening with this well it's kind of wibbly wobbly but eventually it's going down to minus 90 that makes sense because as we talked about when i have one zero and two poles uh as i go up 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 i'm gonna get that uh, positive 90 and then minus two positive 90, so that's a minus 90 right there. So the count of the poles and zeros determines usually that end behavior that we have for that function. Actually, it always does. It'll always tell you what's going on. 
So if I have more pulls than zero, or more zeros than pulls, I just expect this to go to positive 90 at the end. Okay, if that were something I could do. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Uh, what else can I what else can I say about this plot? Um, that's pretty much it. This is just a useful way to see the frequency behavior. So what's going on here? I start off at a particularly uh, a particular value for my magnitude, and then that magnitude's going ever ever smaller. Notice then in the decibel scaling, I don't ever actually hit the bottom, right? It's just going to go on for forever because this is just getting infinitely smaller and closer to zero as this gets more and more negative. Notice here that if I turn the decibel scaling off, that this will actually converge to zero, just as it does in the decibels. You just can't see it in the decibels because we're more concerned about the logarithmic scaling on, on our problem. But effectively here, this has just got two humps in it, uh, starts off at 0.5 and comes down. This is very similar to our other circuit in a lot of ways. Um, the phase behavior characteristics kind of warble here in this range because we have two different poles going on. So you can imagine that there's two things going on, right? There's sort of, uh, I'm starting to converge to that behavior, but actually I changed my mind. And then as I get really high frequencies um, or higher frequencies, I, I start to get past that point and say, you know what? I don't care anymore. Um, I'm just going to be behaving like a typical uh, ideal capacitor for, for this. Um, and that's what's going to end up happening for us is the, the high frequency behavior is going to give us that classic um, capacitor behavior for, for uh, sinusoidal signal, or uh, excuse me, for um, frequency. Okay, clear as mud. Yep. All right, so I'm going to jump back to the iPad now and walk you guys through some of the... Uh, mechanics of how to actually do the calculations. So one other thing I wanted to mention on here before I, uh, I ran off on you. Um, so on the computer, uh, you can actually go to Wolfram Alpha and plop in this function and just write Bode plot of the transfer function, yeah. And uh, make sure you keep track of those parentheses, they're important, but it'll show you what function you're trying to do the Bode plot for. If you compare this to what we have uh, before, uh, this actually looks quite similar. Um, looks like the magnitude here is in uh, decibels. It might be a slightly different decibel scaling. I, I'm not sure. Um, actually, I don't think we plotted this one with decibels, as a matter of fact. So this is probably right. Um, anyways, um, one cool thing to note on this guy here is that if you were to take out the zero, this thing would just snap back like a rubber band right here. And you just have that nice knee of the curve right up in there. Um, so no worries there. It would actually be right at... Um, right at one. So that's kind of cool to see. Um, what else is in here? Ooh, ooh, Nyquist plots. These are really cool. You'll learn about these, uh, I think in 301 maybe, hopefully. If not, you can just ask Sotowski about them uh, when you're in there and be like, oh yeah, no, I already know how uh, how these Bode plots and stuff work and how convolution works. Can we skip that? Can you do some Nyquist plot? And he'll be like, you're awesome. Who was your teacher? And you can be like, Art Turlup. And he'll say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's why you're so awesome. So, <laughs> anyway, no, Nyquist plots are fun um, for obvious reasons. It just, it, it, it does some really cool stuff with the complex plane. I'll just leave it at that. Um, I don't actually know what a Nichols plot is. Uh, yeah, so something for me to look up sometime. Anywho, um, yeah, I just wanted to add in that tidbit about Wolfram Alpha. This is a great computational engine. I'm sure all of you have used it before. I actually met Stephen Wolfram. He's a bit of a prick, but um, he makes good stuff. So, you know, I give him some credit. He's a smart guy. He's actually doing some uh, physics stuff right now, too, which I think is really, really cool. Um, so, you know, check out that stuff. I think, I can't remember if it's called Physics Alpha or what he ended up calling it, but something else interesting for you to do and you're you know <laughs> huge amount of free time i'm sure you guys actually have yeah right um so anyways all right back to the ipad or the lecture 
Okay, so I want to walk through this process that we do for doing the calculation on this particular example here. So for example two, we're going to go over exactly how to go from a transfer function into a magnitude and phase plot. And what we're going to do is we're going to plot just one point in particular. Uh, we're just going to pick kind of an arbitrary point at omega equals one. Generally speaking, the uh, the PZ plotter that I, I gave you guys for MATLAB will work just fine. Um, but this, you're going to need to know how to do this for future work. And if you understand how to do it for points that lie on this axis, then you'll be able to do it for any point in the, in the complex plane. Okay. Um, it's the same process. It's just going to be, uh, you know, in, in other locations as you as you may go. So just worry about stuff on the J omega axis for right now. And here's here's how we do it. So when we look at omega equals one, we plug in one into these two equations. So the way Tom has laid it out here is he's looking at every single point and then calculating its magnitude and its angle. I really like this approach. Uh, it's not very effective to do in practice, but it does help gauge our expectations for where things should be. So for the first one, for example, I'm not going to run through all of these, but for the first one at, uh, for a zero at J2, we have a vector that's pointing downwards from J1 to J2. So notice here that if our so this is from an old example, old book example, and needs updated. So sorry about that. Um, so let me write it out in here in the notes so that you guys have it. Okay. So we note first, we draw our axes. Let's do that here. And we have uh, plus minus j, or excuse me, plus minus 2j. So this is at 2j here and minus 2j here. And then for our poles, we have them here, here, and here, as we saw in the, in the MATLAB. So it's going to be at 1 and then uh, 1 plus j and 1 minus j. I'm sorry, negative 1 plus j and negative 1 minus j. So, negative 1 plus j, negative 1 minus j, and exactly at negative 1. So all of these are in a line, okay? All right, so now we're going to calculate these different vectors for a particular point of interest. So I'm going to pick a point at omega equal 1, which gives me 1j, right? Because we use omega j in the equations. So now I'm going to take all these vectors. So let's do this one first. I have this magnitude here, right? This is just a magnitude of 1, and it's pointing downward. So that's my, uh, this is 1 with a, ma uh, excuse me, a magnitude of 1 with an angle of minus 90. Okay, having length 1, angle of minus 90. Let's do a couple more. Um, so let's look at this one. This is going up by 3. So it's got a magnitude of 3 with an angle of 90. Okay, everyone see that? It's facing upwards, so the, the direction that it's facing with respect to the axis is 90 degrees. Okay, let's look at this guy here. This one is pointing, whoops, not that way. Let's do this one. This one is one away from the axis. So this is actually just equal to, notice this is not to scale, by the way. <laughs> My apologies on that. Um, the magnitude here is one with an angle of zero, right? Length of one, angle of zero for this guy. Um, for this other one, it's at 45 degrees. That's pretty easy to see. Um, not when I don't have the scale correct. <laughs> <laughs> but notice here that this length is 1 and this length is 1, so all is right in the universe. This is actually 45 degrees. It's just a little smooshed, so no worries there. 
So what we end up with here is a is a um, angle of 45 degrees. And then what's the magnitude of this? Well, it's got to be uh, 1 squared plus 1 squared, square root of that. So that's just square root of 2. Yeah, it should just be square root of 2. And so it is. Okay. And then our last one is at uh, right here. And this one's a little bit uh, trickier to calculate because it's actually uh, square root of 5 for that magnitude. So if we look here, this is going over 1 and up uh, 2. Oops, sorry about that. So the magnitude here is square root of 5, which is 1 squared plus 2 squared, right, which is square root of 5 uh, when we take the square root. And the angle when you take the uh, arctangent of the ratio of the, uh, you know, the adjacent and the hypotenuse here, uh, you end up with, what did I say, uh, 63 degrees. Okay. So now all we got to do is for the angles, I should really underline these to make this proper. But for the angles, what we're going to do is we do minus 90 plus 90, and then we subtract off the other guys. So 0 plus 45 uh, plus 63. Okay, and that gives us our, our net angle, our net phase, uh, which is calculated for us here is... Uh, you know, minus 180, or I'm sorry, minus 108. So this is minus 108 degrees. And you can use regular old degrees for this or radians. Um, but uh, yeah, whatever you like. Um, I personally like radians a little bit more, but that's just because of my math background. I think in electrical engineering, this tends to be a little bit more useful, honestly. Um, just because it's when you encounter more engineering type problems for starters, uh, you generally have less decimals cause you have a bigger number. So you don't have to, when you round off, you round off nicely with, uh, radians, you kind of have to round off a little bit arbitrarily sometimes cause you have like 0 0.3, 6, 9, 4, 7, you know, whatever. And you're like, oh, I guess maybe this decimal point will work. But for, you know, degrees, you can kind of be like, oh, 108, that's, you know, good enough. So it's got a nice, nice delimiter, natural delimiter right there. Um, anyways, that was a weird tangent. Uh, so that's our angle. Let's look at the magnitude then. We just take, uh, we do 1 and 3. So 1 times 3 over the product of these. Boop, boop, boop. So we have 1 times square root of 2 times square root of 5. And this gives us, uh, I should hope, our final answer, 3 over the square root of 10. Uh, you can leave it like this. You don't need to use a calculator to simplify it. This is perfectly fine uh, for the magnitude. And so this is equal to h of, and it's actually for a particular value. It's not just j omega, actually, right? It's, in fact, just j1 or 1j. And make sure you keep those magnitude bars on there so that we know that we're looking at the magnitude. Similarly, this is just our angle of H one J. Sorry about the, the room there. Ran out of space. Okay. So that's how you calculate these by hand. And as you would move this around the plane, this point, uh, you could do other things with it, but for our purposes here, again, we're just going to stay on this axis. All right. And we're going to, pretty much just stay positive is all we care about because you got to stay positive if you're going to succeed in this. <laughs> but I'm all right. Enough of that. Okay, so now I want to talk about, um, you know, this is kind of the, the long way to figure out where things end up going at a particular spot. Um, but I want to talk about the easy way now. And for that, uh, we're going to turn to Dr. Strange Decibel. Actually, this is Dr. Strange Love from uh, the, the movie Dr. Strange Love. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I uh, highly recommend. Uh, it's one of those that you'll see in like a film class, almost any of them. Um, but 
Yeah, you know, it's funny how much of that is actually accurate to how the B-52 works. Um, okay, so let's look at what decibels get us in terms of simplicity for trying to do our body plots. All right, so suppose I have a transfer function. H of S is equal to some constant K over, uh, let's say, S plus 10 and then S plus 1,000. Okay? And what I want to know is roughly what is the behavior of my body plot over, uh, you know, a certain, certain logarithmic interval, right? Um, how do I define this? So first of all, we're going to start with the pole zero plot. So we're going to have a Z, or excuse me, a pole right here at minus 10 and another pole out here at minus a thousand, not to scale, mind you. So one of the things that I want to point out here is that when we think about frequencies in this domain, right, this is a frequency space, um, what we really care about is, of course, just this J omega axis that we've, we've been hammering on this whole time, but really we care about how far away anything is from the origin, because if you recall from, I believe, last time, we were talking about how frequencies are essentially just a distance from the origin, right? So... This defines a circle, right? This omega naught, if you want to call it that, whatever omega you want to choose, can kind of define a circle around this origin. And so what we're going to find, actually, is that um, for our various poles, they actually sit at a certain frequency which matches, you know, in, in, uh, in radius, some particular point along the J omega axis. And that special point becomes an inflection point for us in our... Bode plot, okay? So it really doesn't matter if it if it's on this this real axis line or not. It could sit, um, for example, this could sit out here, and we would still have a very similar procedure. Um, it just would be slightly modified. And the relationship between the poles and zeros kind of changes things too. But anyways, let's go ahead and get started on this. So when I'm down here at around s equals zero, okay? So near near s equals zero, word omega is roughly zero, right? As we're moving up through here. Um, the magnitude of both of these is roughly equal to a thousand until I get to about 10, right? And then at 10, things start to take off for this one. Okay? So I'll mark some intervals up here. And we're going to look at an in-betweener point, too, at 1,000. So between 0 and 10 omega, what do we have? Well, we have essentially a constant magnitude from our, uh, our two poles. And uh, our angle is, uh, we're going to leave the, the, the phase off of this for right now. We'll just, just deal with the magnitude actually. So let's not worry about that. Um, so what we have then is essentially a constant, right? If we look at the log scale of this is 20 log 10 of K over, and this S is really close to zero. So it's just 10 times a thousand. Um, if we're doing that, that decibel scaling. Okay. So whatever that ends up being based on K, uh, it's going to be kind of a flat line for that that period of time. So looking down here at our our Bode plot, we're going to have some kind of constant here. And that constant's going to be, you know, starting off equal to 20 log uh, k over you know, 10,000. Okay. Now, what happens right around 10? Well, right around 10, I start to hit this inflection where I can't just assume that S is small enough compared to 10, right? When, once S gets close to 10, uh, this actually starts to bend over and, and start to fall. But how fast does it fall from that point? Well, we saw that it falls at about negative 20 decibels uh, per decade or per, uh, yeah, Per, per factor of 10 for our uh, frequency. Is that generally true? Well, as it turns out, yes, it is. For poles and then for zeros, they actually go up. So let's explore that a little bit. 
So the, the distance here from here to here and from here to here, this is still about a thousand, right? But this one's going to be uh, 10 square root two. And so right at 10, that's where it's going to, going to be, but that's close enough for us. Um, and that's just fine. So what happens as I go from 10 out to say a hundred now, now it starts picking up steam after 10 pretty quickly, I might add, um, what's the behavior look like? Well, okay. So if I look between like 10 and a hundred, right, the contribution from the pole at 10 down here, right, is roughly going to start being about as much omega as I have going up, right? They're going to be roughly equivalent to each other. Um, and then as I look at the negative 1000 pole, this is still an order of magnitude off right here between here and here. So, you know, it's not exact, but it's close enough. Okay. And it's close enough to make this assumption that it, this essentially turns into uh, 20 log base 10 of K over what is effectively Omega now times a thousand. And this note is not this guy, right? Because this guy represents the entire uh, transfer function. We're just looking at the magnitude, okay? The, and the magnitude is going to be defined by those distances. And so we multiply those distances in the denominator. So I'm approximating these two distances here just to give us a feel, all right? So this is all approximation work. All right, so now when I start to look at this, as I move down, this is effectively going to turn into this, okay? And that's because I can break up that uh, logarithmic function. And what does that tell me? Well, it tells me that I have some constant that I'm sitting at and then I'm starting to fall at roughly, um, you know, a rate of 20 decibels, right, per decade, all right? That's where that's coming from. Okay, so you say, so what? Well, actually what that does for me is if I start here, I can track my progress as I continue to, to roll down. And actually, let me draw this a little bit with less of an incline because I'm gonna need some wiggle room to work. Okay, so it's gonna fall at a rate of minus 20 dB per uh, factor. 10. Okay, so this is falling at a rate of minus 20 dB per factor of 10 omega. So then what happens here at 1000? Well, at 1000, the same thing that happened to our first pole now occurs to... Okay, so at 1000 plus omega, right, and beyond, um, we effectively end up with an omega squared down there. For omega at 1,000 and greater, what's going to happen is this is going to turn into 20 log base 10 of k over omega squared, right? Because approximately, as this goes way up here, these two guys are roughly um, equal to the distance that omega is away along this axis, right? Because this distance here between here and here gets relatively smaller. And we've talked about this as Omega grows much larger than a thousand. Okay. So right at a thousand, we start to get that, that knee of the curve. And what do you know? This actually is now falling at a rate of uh, minus 40 DB, right? If I write it out like, so, uh, this is 20 or minus 40 now, uh, log Omega because that square just comes out front, right? So effectively what's going on here is this is going to, at this point, start to fall at a new rate that's twice what it was before. So rate of minus 40, oops. Okay, let's do another example so that we can really bring this home and see what happens when we include zeros as well. Okay, so let's do a... A plot here. We'll have one at minus a thousand for a pole. We'll keep one at uh, minus one. We're gonna have a zero at uh, minus ten, and we're gonna have 
two poles here and here at, uh, we'll say, minus uh, J99, and, I'm sorry, plus J99, and minus J99. Okay, so these are roughly 100, so we're going to put them there um, as, a, as an approximation. So here's the long and short of it. Um, basically, the Bode plot ends up looking like this, y'all. So here's my, my plot. It starts off with that, uh, that magnitude that we calculate. So at zero, these are all roughly just whatever distance they are from the origin. So this is going to be uh, equal to uh, 20 log base 10 of k. Let's just assume we have a, a nice little, or I'm sorry, not k, uh, do, 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 do. Well, it may have some k factor in here, whatever it may be. Uh, our zeros go up top, so we'll do 99 times 99 times 10 over 1 times 1,000, okay? That's where this is going to start off for the magnitude because that's the, the length of all of these vectors to the origin. <clears throat> so here we go. We start off, and then at uh, 1 on the log scale... Right, if we if we do a nice log scale on this, is ten to the zero. Which, by the way, I should have mentioned that when we were drawing this out, uh, you can see the equal distance, uh, equal distances here. Um, tacitly, I'm using the log scale for this, right? The decibel and the log scale on the x-axis here. Okay, so anyways, at one we hit our first milestone where this is going to start falling. And in fact, since this is a pole here, this is going to fall at a rate of minus twenty dB. Per decade okay now as I continue to move I run into my distance here which is 10 right so this is at 10 to the first I hit my first zero well that first zero is on the top side so it actually cancels out what's happening with that uh, the approximation for that pole, right? If we're thinking about it in terms of the uh, logarithmic expression, I have some stuff up here, I have some stuff up here, but now these two, this pole and the zero, are approximated by the following. Here's my pole, and here's my zero. So they roughly cancel each other out, and I end up with a constant again of whatever's left over. Okay, so it it has fallen 20 dB until this point, and at this point, it actually stabilizes for a little while. And now, I keep going. And I keep going until I get to this distance here, which is about 100 away from the, uh, from the origin. So this is now at 10 squared. Well, a funny thing happens. You may think, well, you know, it really doesn't matter what happens with this guy down here for magnitude, right? Because... Um, you know, who cares? It's so far away already. Why does it matter? Well, it's about the, the rate at which it's increasing away from either of these, right? And so when I think about it, um, what I end up with is that both of these are contributing effectively after it gets so far away, these become so close. If you were imagining a a telescope or a microscope kind of zooming out from this, these two would quickly converge to the origin after 100, especially on a log scale. So as both of these now are closer to the origin than they are to omega, effectively, then it's actually going to create a contribution that's omega squared in the numerator now. Because... For every contribution that I have as a zero, it goes in the numerator. For every contribution I have as a pull, it goes in the denominator. And so both of these are contributing now to that magnitude with a scaling factor of omega. Meanwhile, this 1,000 is still just chilling out because it's effectively close enough to 1,000 as this passes 100. It's still an order of magnitude away before this actually starts to have any significant changes to it um, based on this, this angle here, Okay. So it hasn't quite hit its own critical point yet. My point here is that at 100, okay, at, at 10 squared, this is now going to go up at two of these. It should be at positive 40 dB per decade. Okay? 
And so you can actually calculate these points. If you know what this original starting line looks like, which is pretty easy to calculate, actually. This is ready to rock and roll. Um, then you can calculate exactly where all these inflection points are going to end up as well. And that's very convenient for us. Okay, so now at, you know, a thousand, oops, too many zeros. At a thousand, I end up tapering back off. And I go back to being at just plus 20 dB per decade for the same reasons I've explained over and over again, which is that now this, this has become at a critical juncture. And so at a thousand, it starts to effectively shrink towards the axis because it's relatively closer to the axis than it is to omega. And so the growth rate approximates the same growth rate as omega. So there we are. We, we effectively have drawn out our Bode plot for something that's very complex um, using the decibel system, which makes life oh so much easier. So, okay. So for next time, What do I want you to do? I want you to review this lecture either here or the book, okay? And look it over and get a really good sense of what's going on with this chapter. It's critically, vitally important that you understand this chapter. And then I also want you guys to um, look up Bodhi plots online somewhere, look at some videos, some YouTube stuff. If you find anything really good on Bodhi Plots, throw it up on Piazza for some other people to find as well. Um, this is a, a community effort, all right? So let's keep it that way. Um, I've been really proud of you guys so far. I know this. we're only in uh, week three here, um, but man, I am really impressed with some of you guys putting forth some of the, some of the work that you have on, uh, on really making this a good class. So thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you guys as students are what make a class great and being at a distance can make it just turn into mush really quickly. Um, but you all have been pretty well engaged in everything. And for that, I thank you. Um, so we've got everything, uh, here. Let's see. There's one other thing I wanted you to do. Uh, oh yeah. Just kind of glance at the next chapter. Um, the, the nice thing about this is it'll, it builds really easily off of um, this chapter here. So take a look in the book and just kind of glaze through it a little bit. You don't have to get in depth or understand all of it. Just kind of be like, okay, I see what's happening here now with, with this stuff. Um, it'll help solidify your understanding of this chapter as well. All right. And please do go look at the practice problems. Okay, so here is uh, problem set 27. Um, some poor schmuck drew these all by hand. <laughs> uh, it wasn't me, guys. I didn't actually write uh, write up this one. So, uh, oh well. <laughs> I was smart enough to make my own Bodhi plotter, so I will have nice charts for this in future versions of the text. Um, so I apologize that they're not in here right now because this would have been super easy to put all these in here. Um, and it would have made me look classy, but, uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, try to, try to work through a lot of these. They will help you a lot, uh, with trying to figure out what the heck is going on with these plots. Okay. And if you have any questions about the code, um, please plot, uh, please plot them, please, uh, post them on Piazza and, uh, I will address them for everybody because, uh, it can be confusing. Um, so yeah. I hope you guys uh, have enjoyed this lecture. This is pretty much worth, it just gets the coolest and it only gets better from here. Um, but uh, it'll be exciting moving forward. Once we get to filtering, man, it's just, it's a whole new world. And this is just the beginning of it. So, all right. I hope you're enjoying it. I'll talk to y'all later.